Sit uh, with mindfulness, Sati um, Sampatanya, centering yourself uh, present here and now the way it is. So you're actually having to listen to my voice for the next hour. <laughs> <coughs> Now, they're emphasizing the mindfulness, awareness. I use these interchangeably. And then Samputanya's intuitive, with intuition. So that this sense of receiving the present. Uh, like an intuitive moment is, is, uh, is not discriminating anything, is not choosing or focusing on one thing by rejecting anything, it's including everything. So this is a natural ability we have. It's it's not, you know, you can't cultivate it as some kind of special state. It's just unrecognized in our lives usually. We, because uh, we're conditioned to always be looking for something, thinking about something, trying to control something, trying to filter away and get rid of the things we don't want. So in the development, condition of our minds, we tend to develop mechanisms that, you know, where we we don't hear what we, what we don't like or we, we, we can pick and choose you know, you wonder why the world is in such a mess because people don't listen. They don't. They don't operate from an intuitive place. They they operate from fear and desire, usually, without knowing it. And so, just bringing into c- consciousness at this time the natural state that we're in as human entities on this planet. This is obvious, but do you ever really contemplate what it is, you know, the reality of being a a human being on a planet in orbit around the sun in a vast universe? (coughs) And then we're stuck here for a lifetime in this body that goes through from birth and grows up, matures and then starts aging and then dies. And it's this is a sense realm. We're living, you know, this is the reality, the experience of sensitivity. So we have senses. The Buddha pointed to the, you know, really observing what it is to be sensitive, to have eyes, uh, and that see things, like seeing, isn't it? It's not, you know, whatever passes in front of our field of vision, whether it's uh, beautiful or ugly, we still see it. Uh, you know, there's a guarantee that we're going to live in, in a realm where there's only beauty. Or sound, smell, taste, touch. Uh, we have developed the intellect, so we have a retentive memory. So we remember 
we 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 have we have a language because we have a, a retentive memory so we can talk about the past i can tell you all about my my past you know my life the things that i've done in the past uh, plans for the future um we can study history archaeology anthropology uh, and then the science, but modern science tends to always be outgoing into objects, isn't it? We, we tend to observe things that, that out in space or through microscopes or telescopes. So we we pick up, we we feel, and the. And this feeling, this is this is what sensitive is all about, feeling. And feeling, of course, is, you know, can be pleasurable, painful, or neutral. So this is just pointing to the way it is having a human birth on this planet. This is this is what we're experiencing, sensitivity, and and sensitivity then in in the body itself, as you no doubt are aware during. Even though this is only the really the first full day, uh, just sitting for very long, you you get sensations in your knees and back and things like this, not pleasurable ones. And some of you might, but usually it's the other way: pain, discomfort, irritations, and on and on, and. So this is just noticing the way. This isn't a complaint or a put down of anything. It's just observing. So that's what the Buddha encourages us to do: to really awaken to the what we're actually experiencing in the present. Now, desire comes, and we want we'd like to only have pleasure, pleasurable sensations, happiness, success. And be respected and liked. Uh, these are the good things in the world. To, to be happy and have beautiful things around us. And feel secure and loved and protected and safe. But then there's also the opposite, the fear, isn't it? Of, of, of being rejected, of having to live with what we don't like of being hurt, of being attacked, physically attacked, of being insulted or abused or despised by the society, being a failure. So this is all what sensitivity is about. It's a, about these extremes, happiness and suffering, pleasure, pain, heaven, hell. And this is experienced through consciousness, but we're experiencing consciousness in a form, in a, in a human body. And this human body is a totally sensitive form, as you may have noticed. And that's just the way it is. And so, like when we contemplate Vedana, or feeling, pleasure, pain, neutral feeling, you know, we, we're constantly, from the time we're born, to the time the body dies, are going to be impinged on by the things that that are around us, that that impinge on our senses, on our mind. So, uh, you know, there is a when we when we don't understand this, then we're always trying to control and protect ourselves. If we experience a lot of suffering, then we become very uh, frightened by life. Life is a threat and danger. Fear motivates us. If we're just uh, seeking happiness all the time, trying to, to have fun, good time, be successful, life is beautiful, uh, and we would like to just experience the pleasures of the, <coughs> sense of the senses, of the mind, because these are desirable. These are what we would like. And the other is what we don't want. So desires form, don't they? We desire for 
happiness, security, pleasure, and the desire to get rid of or protect ourselves from or resist all forms of misery, pain, loss, ugliness, insecurity, and, and these these words convey that that extreme of this dualistic structure that we're experiencing through consciousness at this very moment. Now notice that we talk about dualism, we have extremes. If you have happiness, if you have sukha, then there's dukkha. One and then they go together. Two sides of the same coin. When you then there's heaven and hell. They're a couple. They go together. And then there's uh, praise and blame. We like to be praised. I mean, everybody be appreciated and respected. And, and but we fear, and fear blame being criticized, blamed and despised. And we like the feeling of success, of being somebody important and successful in the world. People look up to and they admire you, envy you, but we fear also failure. So when when we're aiming for these extremes, like so modern life is so much an attempt to try to control everything, to provide a security that makes us feel uh, everything is okay. And then the the aims is to be successful, to be happy, to be liked, to be popular, to be loved, to be uh, somebody important. And then there's the feelings that we have when we we can't, you know, when we when when things change, when we're despised, rejected, sick, lonely, no friends, out in the cold miserable, diseased. (laughs) And a failure. (laughs) 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 Now this is, now, we can think of our, what we're doing here is in terms of success, how successful a meditator are you? You know, are you, do you consider yourself successful at meditation or a failure? Um, and and what do you, how do you see yourself? You know, somebody that's success, a successful person, somebody that everybody loves, that's lovable, that's worthy of respect, or do you see yourself in terms of being a failure or unlovable or rejected or, or not good enough? Because we form a, 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 a sense of ourself with these, with these dualisms, with these extremes. Or we can say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just an ordinary guy, you know, not successful, not failure. <coughs> some people like me, some people don't. <laughs> but that's still, <laughs> that's another, uh, that's another mask we can create, an illusion we can create about ourselves. Now how to get outside of that dualism? Because we're stuck in it. That's why why we're here, this retreat. <laughs> 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 and the society is, is believes in it totally in the dualistic, in in the, uh, you know, the idea of progress and success and, and you know, creating a perfect society and uh, where everything's fair, we're very idealistic. Uh, we have ideals and, and they're, they're one extreme. An ideal is an extreme. You can create an ideal in your mind, uh, you know, and it can be absolutely perfect flawless ideal, you know, where everything's fair and right and everybody, would like heaven, tends to be when we, when we create uh, images of heavenly life, it's where we're happy all the time and totally safe and loved unconditionally and everything's pretty. 
and there's no pain, no arthritis. <laughs> no bird flu, anything like that. There's no even rumors of bird flu in heaven. <laughs> so heaven, I mean, you, you can create an image of heaven in your mind. That's an ideal. And it's beautiful. You can, you can get it ultimately beautiful and perfect. Or you can also create a hell in your mind where life is just miserable, everybody's a self-centered, self-seeking, you can't trust anybody, life is miserable, it's all about pain and disease, old age and, and uh, death, demons, ugliness, violence, war. And then we, that's depression. Right? I'm no good, I'll never be any good, I'm hopeless. And that's the other extreme. Now that takes thought, doesn't it? You have to you have to create those those uh, those images and grasp them and believe in them. So you know, we create ourselves as personalities. You know, so uh, me as a person. You have to start thinking about myself to become a person. You know, I'm Majan Sumedho, and I'm like this. And then I become that. You know, if I believe <coughs> if I believe what I'm thinking and the and the perceptions that I attach to, and then I am. A, I'm always, you know, uh, creating myself as a personality, identified with my appearance, with my body, with the age of my body. Um, with its gender, identified with it be, being a male or female, agen- identified with being black or white, or being tall or short, or being uh, upper class, middle class, working class. <laughs> there are all these identities that we actually believe in are re- real. And um, and we look at the people around us, the world around us, we believe it's, it's reality. And w- sometimes here in the monastery, much of the society uh, looks at us, uh, looks at monks and nuns as people that aren't living in the real world. They say, "Well, you don't live in the real world, Ajahn Sumedho. You know, you don't have a mortgage and three children." <laughs> You're not, uh, well, I am unemployed. Where am I? (laughs) I don't quite know where I fit into that category. (laughs) Because, you know, the the real world is, is the world that people tend to assume is real. What, what's considered normal and and approved of, or how things should be, in in a culture or a society. And then it looks like here at Amaravati, we're we're, li- we're not living in that world. We're living in kind of they they sometimes assume that we're just living in in highly evolved states of samadhi. So we're always kind of floating above it all. <laughs> But we don't really do that very much. (laughs) (laughs) So what I'm doing is is trying to, to, you know, reflect on on the way it is as a human individual. The way it is. Not how I would like it to be or as an ideal, but the way it is. So, you know, when when you're practicing meditation, you know, you'd, you know, when I first started, I used to, I used to always want to get into some very intense state of samadhi where I wouldn't feel any pain, or wouldn't feel any worry or any negativity. You know, I just feel this bliss and oneness with everything, and and I just wanted to get out of this this sensitive realm. This this self. I tend to be as a person self-critical. 
I turn my thinking mind, my critical mind towards myself, and I always see something wrong with myself as a person. So this is, you know, this is a habit uh, that that I developed uh, on the condition level of, of uh, comparing myself to others, to ideals, and and then always noticing what's wrong or the 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 flaw or the weakness, the the thing that isn't quite good enough or or that's terribly wrong with me as a person. And then that becomes my, you know, I, what I hold up is the, you know, what I dwell on, tend to exaggerate. And I used to not notice at all my goodness. So when I went to live in Thailand, and then to stay with Ajahn Chah, <coughs> he said some surprising thing. He said, you must contemplate your own goodness. Never thought of that before. <laughs> Completely new idea. <laughs> and my first reaction was, "Oh, I don't want to do that because <laughs> I'll just get in, you know, I'll get an inflated ego. You know, just you know, I'm gonna, you know, being honest is admitting your faults, isn't it? If you're going to be honest with me, okay, tell me what's wrong with you." <laughs> And I say, okay, be honest, and you tell me about your goodness. I say, rubbish. (laughs) (coughs) You aren't facing reality. (laughs) What are you covering up? No, this is good and bad, and and virtues and faults. So, and this is on a personal level how we create ourselves with these with these thoughts with these. Uh, memories. Now we can be aware of this. So that's a, that's what the point of this retreat is: awakening to um, to wake up to this dualism, to be able to put it in a perspective, uh, to be able to to, in other words, transcend it. Not, but transcending doesn't mean getting way outside it and in, in where it doesn't affect you. But being able to see it, to notice and observe, and free yourself from just blind, ignorant attachment to the these dualisms or the conditioned realm. Now how do you do that? <coughs> Great idea. And and the and the answer is very simple. Pay attention. So this this of mindfulness awareness is is the gate or the door. The only possibility we have in this present moment is through awakening and paying attention, listening, being attentive. So we're not we're not trying to find anything and, and trying to create some or get something that we imagine we'd like to have, or just resist the the bad things, the negative thoughts and the pain and all that, but awaken to the way it is now, the way that each one of us is experiencing this, the, the, the body that you have, or the, the uh, <coughs> character, the, the emotional habits that, that you are experiencing, your memories and thoughts, good, bad, right, wrong, heaven, hell, doesn't make any difference. The awareness, putting them into that perspective, is what mindfulness is. So when I chanted in the beginning, before I started this reflection, it was Aparuta uh, de Sangamatasa Taura. This I'm sure you understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was uh, the Buddha announced after his enlightenment: the gate to the deathless is open. <coughs> so the gate. The deathless is open. This is a metaphor, isn't it? But it, but it's pointing to this awareness. This is the gate. This is the, the gate to the deathless. Well, the deathless then is the dualisms are all about death, isn't it? And the body is about death. The clinging, you know, the identity with your physical body, 
you're clinging to death because that's what's going to happen to it. <laughs> so we, we don't want to think about that. <laughs> that's negative. <coughs> but not trying to be negative or, you know, but to point to the reality of that, that, that the body, once it's born, birth is the cause for death. You have birth and you have death. So that the awareness then of the body is the, g- is the gate to the deathless. So the deathless then is awareness itself. Now the, the word deathless is a, is a word you can't imagine, can you? you can it, it's kind of an abstract idea in terms of the word itself. It means that which isn't born and doesn't die, deathless, the uh, immortal, nibbana. And uh, these kind of words are empty. They have shunyata, anatta, niroda, nibbana. All these w- Pali words they this is these are you can't ima- you can't create images of nothing or emptiness or the deathless so because it's not imagined you can't imagine it but it's real it's reality so that that's why this awareness this simple ability we have to just pay attention in the present the reality of the deathless. It's real. It's a fact. It's not some abstract philosophical or metaphysical idea. (coughs) It's provable. So that's the point of, say, the Buddhist teaching, is to realize this. uh, To realize is it, it is is about reality. This is, you know, to recognize this that we that we don't we can't imagine, we we can't point to as an object, we can't hold it in our hands like this is a deathless, or you can't point to some some uh, you know point it out as some something out there, but it's real. So that's where the 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 only way that we can realize the deathless is through attentiveness or awakenness. And so that is the very meaning of Buddha. The word Buddha is awakened. So you might think of Buddhism, Buddha as a sage, ancient Indian sage, uh, which is not one way of looking at Buddha. Fair enough. That that can be very inspiring. I I love the stories of the Buddha and the Gotama the Buddha and all that. <laughs> not uh, not trying to put it down, but that can't is not liberating. <coughs> that ca- best it can do is inspire you. But Buddha, Gotama the Buddha was pointing, you know, at this reality. And so that's why he's called the Buddha. And when we when we started this retreat last evening, then we took refuge in the Buddha. We said, Bhutang Sarnangachami. Now this it means that we're taking refuge in awareness. It's as simple as that. You're not taking refuge in some sage of the past or some kind of imagined Buddha nature out there or Buddha's up in the sky or anything like that. Or maybe you just said it because you felt you had to. But now I'm trying to to bring this word so it's usable, so it's practical. It helps you. It's not just just cluttering up your mind or causing you all kinds of doubts. Was there really a Buddha? Is Buddha God? Or is, uh, you know... Is there real proof that there ever was a Buddha? <laughs> we could spend our lives you know, trying to 
figure all that out. But the but the reality, the word itself is awakened, conscious awakenedness within a human form. So it's a refuge. I mean, a, a refuge is a safe place. When we all want a safe place to be because it is a frightening world that we're living in. You know, just physically. We're so, you know, we're very uh, vulnerable, easily wounded, easily hurt physically. It doesn't take much to, to kill a human being. They can get squashed like flies and and blowing up with with nuclear weapons and look what's happening in Iraq to this day. Probably right now there have been 50 people blown up with a bomb or something. This is a, this, so there is a lot of things to be frightened of on the physical level. There's a lot to be frightened of on the emotional level because we can we we're easily hurt, insulted when somebody insults me and abuses me. I it hurts me. I feel this pain. You know, so you know, if people gang up on me and and insult me and call me nasty names, it hurts. Not physically <laughs> but, you know, emotionally that's sometimes even worse than physical pain. So that's what sensitivity is about. Sensitivity is, is pleasure pain. <coughs> but in but when we recognize or realize mindfulness, awareness, satisampachanya, then it doesn't mean we don't we stop feeling, but we have a context for feeling. We're a refuge we're in a refuge of knowing, of Awakened knowing. It's one, it's universal, it's not it's not personal. I can't say that I am a Buddha. That would sound personal. And then you, you have every right to walk out of this <laughs> meditation hall. But ta- but w- this is a we're putting refuge in the Buddha. This this I like because this I, I one can do. It's not it's not an ego trip, you know, that I can take refuge in the Buddha better than you can. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but it means, it's a reflection, isn't it, of, of uh, to me, Bhutang Sarnangachami, whenever I hear that, it just reminds me, this is it, awareness. Being here and now fully attentive, open to the way it is. And that's the Dhamma, Dhammang Sarnangachami. So the word Dhamma is is uh, also another useful word uh, because it, it it's the way it is, the truth of the way it is. It's not defined in, in you know, as it's not a metaphysical concept. But it's it's a it's a word that is usable because through taking refuge in Buddha we're we're awakened to the way it is. What we're experiencing through consciousness, pleasure, pain, praise, blame, happiness, suffering. We're aware of it. And we're aware and then we, we contemplate it we reflect on the nature of conditioned experience like pleasure, pain, praise, blame, and all these, these dualisms there, they arise and cease. There's nothing permanent. They're not the deathless. They're not Nibbana. It's <laughs> but they are what they are. You know, they have different qualities and, and, and so they have, they can be refined or coarse or Mediocre or high or low, but and these are qualities, aren't they? They can be good and bad, right and wrong. So we're recognizing that this intuitive awareness puts us into, put, gives us uh, ability to reflect on the way it is, the body itself, 
the breathing of the body, the sensations, the, the experiences that we have through the senses, the, the memories that arise and cease, the thoughts, the obsessions, the fears, the desires, that, that, all, that whole, uh, all that is possibly created, all that begins and ends, all that is impermanent. But our refuge is in the deathless, not in the conditions anymore. Until we realize this, then uh, we tend to be uh, totally identified with the conditions. And that's why we suffer. Because the conditions are unsatisfying. Because they're, they're subject to change all the time. They're changing. You can't keep them. You can't sustain them and, and make them stay with you and control everything so that you're permanently happy and secure uh, and, and uh, respected in, in this realm. You can't stop the aging process of your body. Many people try these days. <laughs> and all kinds of ways to delude yourself. You know, to make you think you're not getting old, but the, the reality is that's its nature. The body, you know, just like, you wouldn't want to be stuck at just being a baby forever, would you? <laughs> Permanent baby for eternity. <coughs> Even though babies are, you know, beautiful creatures, but they, they, their nature is to grow and develop and mature. And then that reaches a peak, doesn't it? You don't keep growing, developing, maturing forever. It reaches a peak and then it goes the other way. <laughs> I'm getting to the end of the <laughs> downhill slide. And the... the uh, so this is just the way it is. Now, <coughs> rec developing or tra recognizing this awareness, because it's not a created state. You, you, you can't create awareness. You can create refined concentration through controlling the mind and focusing on things and shutting out the course the noisy, the ugly, the disruptive, by, you know, controlling the environment and concentrating on something that is refined. And you, it makes you feel, it gives you, you know, that sense of being refined, which is quite pleasant, pleasurable feeling. But you can't sustain it because conditions change. You, you can't control uh the conditioned realm to sustain the illusion. So there's no point in trying to control everything out of fear and ignorance, but the, then the, as the Buddha said, wake, wake up, pay attention, observe how, how it is being human being like this, being having to live in a sensitive form for a lifetime. What's the point of it? You know, what is the purpose? Wh why? why? Why this? I used to wonder when I was young, what's the point of life? You know, and uh, what's it for? Is it, uh, you know, when I was, before I discovered Buddhism, I used to think it was just a bad joke. <laughs> because to me, being sensitive was, you know, it's, 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 it means that you, You've got to go through a whole lifetime of feeling and of being identified and frightened and and restless and and there's so much to fear and so many unknown things and what's in the future? What will happen to me? What if I lose my health? What if I lose my my house, my property, my loved ones, my goldfish? So you you know when we when we when we know like the drama of human existence you know all the kind of soap operas and and stories they're all about this you know 
unrequited love, not getting what you want, or despair at the loss of the loved, um, the violence, <coughs> isn't it? Violence. We have wars are exciting things. Violence and sex are very exciting. So pop entertainment, the, the cinema likes to produce these kind of images because they excite us. You know, the sexual images they are very exciting to the human consciousness and violence. Men especially, we love. You love these war films. <laughs> and <laughs> sports, you know, competitive, you know, out to beat, conquer, and win. These are, these are very exciting to the human mind. But excitement also is impermanent. You can't sustain this excitement for very long. And then, then, then we become bored. Life, so much of life is quite boring, isn't it? You know, just day to day, you know, getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, having breakfast, getting ready to go to work, walking to the underground station. All this is routine, boring. This is not exciting stuff. But you can look forward to the football match game and and something that or the holiday in some exotic place or some you know climbing Mount Everest or or looking for the perfect mate you know the romantic ideal of finding somebody that really excites you and interests you and fascinates you <coughs> but then you can't sustain any of these states <laughs> Even even if you find such a person, it doesn't last, does it? It's uh, unsustainable. And so th what I'm d doing is just reflect the, the condition phenomena is like this. It's not a complaint, but a, but just observing. It's nature. It's supposed to be like this. There's nothing wrong with it. And and you know, but it is like this. And so this ability to reflect, to observe, is what the Buddha was, it's all about what Buddha teaching is about. The waking up and noticing the way it is. So he points to in all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. We chant in the pujas, the base and Karani chant, all conditions are impermanent. Now that, you can, you know, we all agree to that, you know, that seems reasonable enough. But there's a lot that we don't really, like subtle things and assumptions and attitudes that, that we, ad we don't reach in ordinary life because we, we, we're, all, we're creatures of habit. We become easily conditioned and operate from the limitations of our habits. And, and so, uh, the, and, the, and a lot goes unrecognized in our lives. So in meditation retreats also, or uh, spending time where you're sitting by yourself and just in being, being attentive and aware, you'll, things will start coming up into your consciousness that might surprise you, or, you know, or unwanted memories, or, or emotion, repressed emotional habits that, you know, that you, you, you know, you controlled can start surfacing in meditation retreats. So don't let, don't think something's going wrong when that happens. It's like, it's the purification. I call that purification. When you, when you're suddenly letting go of your obsessive need to control everything, and there's no escape because you're sitting here in the and he's still got half an hour to go. <laughs> then, then that's good because then maybe you know the the emotions like fears, uh, irrational fears or resentments from the past. In all our lives, there's a lot to resent. In that, in a human lifetime. 
being human, life isn't always fair. And we're not always treated properly and respected the way we should be. You know, so we resent that. We resent the fact that we we haven't, you know, that every moment of our life hasn't been, you know, we, we've had experience being blamed for things we haven't done, for being misunderstood, taken for granted, exploited, abused, ignored, and that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> So then we can build up resentments and bitterness about that that life isn't isn't hasn't treated us well. These kind of things they start coming up into consciousness. So just let them. The aim there is not to control, but to learn to relax and open and allow. So so don't resist or fight anything. Just just have an attitude of receiving, welcoming. This is like metta practice too, loving kindness. Or loving kindness, the uh, word metta, Pali word metta, translated is, uh, into English is usually translated loving kindness. It isn't like, uh, and loving kindness can be, I- you know, can be, sound very kind of uh, sentimental, and we must love everything and be kind to everybody. But, Metta is much more profound. It's not sentimental or being nice. It's just allowing even what you don't like to be what it is. Say when we lack loving kindness, then we, then we, even towards ourselves, we, I shouldn't have thoughts like this. I shouldn't feel like this. A good bhikkhu should never get angry. A bhikkhu should always be Filled with compassion for everybody, and, and now I'm don't, I'm I'm I don't have any compassion for anybody. I'm not a good bhikkhu. <laughs> so then we we have you know we we can feel we're not we're not having metta at that moment. We're we're criticizing that we're we're feeling or experiencing something that we don't want and we we'd like to get rid of and that we're ashamed of. But Metta isn't isn't just trying to convince yourself everything is all right. It's not an intellectual process. It's it's the ability to just allow it to be what it is, even if it's miserable and nasty. Allowing it to be means that the, this attitude of open receptivity. being receptive and allowing <coughs> the conditions that you're experiencing to be what they are. Now that sounds easy enough maybe in, in the theory, but this is this is not easy to do because so much of our lives have been spent in trying to to control everything, to get rid of things and not be angry and and not feel jealousy and not be a Frightened of anything, to be brave, and heroic, and and uh, honest, and good, and noble, on and on like this is what I want to be. And then I got this pusillanimous <laughs> jitta, cowardly, frightened, insecure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that, and I hope nobody notices. <laughs> <laughs> but in with metta or awareness now, applying them together, like it's unconditioned. You're not. You're not, There's no conditions. You're letting go of all the conditions. You're allowing the conditions that come to be what they are. You're not, you're, and you're not criticizing them, but you're recognizing, you're discerning. They are what they are. So, like, like fear arises, irrational fear arises. It is what it is. It's like this, and there's a way of of receiving it. It's not meaning approving of it, 
but it means you're allowing it to be, to exist at this moment in your consciousness. And then because it is arising, because it arises and it ceases, you're allowing these conditions to do what they have to do. They arise and they cease. And you're not making a problem about it, in other words. You, you see, when we don't know this, then we're always making problems about the way we think, our emotional habits, the way we look, the people we live with, the society we're living in. We can make endless problems, as you well know. It's, uh, we're very good at making problems about I- anything. Even when there are no problems, <laughs> we can make problems. <coughs> so this is where this 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 is refuge in Buddha know, knowing, realizing Dhamma the way it is, and Sangha, Sankang Sernangachami, is this is sang- you're actually taking refuge in Sangha when you're aware. You're not taking refuge in in some kind of abstract sangha, but it's, it's a, as a human individual, uh, you know, then sangha is the awareness itself. Because then you, then there's wisdom operating, and that wisdom isn't from, from education. It's not acquired knowledge about things, but it's, it's universal wisdom, universal intelligence. When you use the word universal, it means one, and this is oneness then, outside the dualism or diversity, unity and diversity. And they, they use this word a lot, the, the unity and diversity. And they f- figure out how we can all live together on this planet without endlessly killing each other. But nobody understands what unity is. We're certainly aware of the diversity. Uh, in, I was in Bangkok uh, on the 8th of May. I gave a, a public talk in, uh, this having this big conference at the United Nations building. Uh, United Nations, I thought. And there's nothing united about the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> But it is an ideal, <laughs> isn't it? It's a, it is an ideal of unity. But, um, but I mean, and so we think of united as some kind of vague hope in the future, <coughs> where we're all united. We all agree. We all get along. We're all living in peace and harmony. And the lions are lying down with the little lambs. <laughs> but, Unity is here and now, isn't it? Oneness. Universe, these, r- these words. These words convey the, the reality of oneness. And then when you, when you forget that, then th- we're caught in the dualism. The world and all its problems, the physical, the, the physical body we're identified with and all its changing conditions, its aging process, its pain, its sicknesses, and and then the uh, people around us, the society we're in, endless diversity impinging on us, m- grabbing our attention, uh, pulling us into this dualistic realm, and we have no way of getting out of it until we awaken. So uh, the reason why I like these this, these three, like Buddha Dhamma Sangha, because it does it gives you a vocabulary that is not, you know, that is non-personal, and it's not to be seen as, as ideal. It's just Buddhist kind of ideas or ideals, but they're they're to be used. You know, this to me this is Buddha. I'm taking refuge in Buddha is awareness knowing the way it is, because this is here and now. Sangha, living my life in, in, uh, 
in, in the human form and with awareness. Sati and Panya and wisdom. Awareness and wisdom. So the it's a, a very simple, you know, it's ultimate simplicity, because there's, you know, it, it's not. I mean, Buddhism, as it's presented uh, <coughs> academically, sounds incredibly complicated. And you talk to Buddhist scholars, and you think, mind-boggling, you know, <laughs> all they, <coughs> you know, you're tr- people trying to study Abhidhamma before they're even aware. It's self-defeating. <coughs> so you, you know, you, so the the point, you know, the the essential teaching, the kind of expedient means the Buddha used after his enlightenment is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, which is uh, taking the most common experience that all human beings can relate to is suffering or dukkha taking that as the first noble truth and awakening to it, understanding it. So the first noble truth, there is suffering, it should be understood. This is the prescription of Buddhism. It should be understood. To understand suffering isn't kind of trying to figure it out and analyze why do I suffer, but recognizing that suffering is like this. This feeling of wanting something I don't have. The feeling of not liking the way I am. I'm not good enough. I've got to improve myself. I feel a sense of lack in my life. Sense of I feel insecure. Uh, life has not been totally fair to me. And, uh, and then, then here I'm getting old now. And uh, it's just not fair. You know, you should get old and, and then get pain and no I can't you know when I go for walks I I can't keep up with the younger monks (laughs) (laughs) I feel embarrassed (laughs) (laughs) lost my looks (laughs) (laughs) not fair (laughs) <laughs> now to, uh, to understand that is is not to is, is not thinking or analyzing or thinking I shouldn't you know it's not about shouldn't but suffering is like this you know the sense of me as a body me wanting not wanting fearing you know kind of worrying about things and and dreading and feeling ill at ease and and unsatisfied by things, bored and uh, incomplete. So it doesn't have to be like you know really horrible suffering. I mean, there's just ordinary life, and there's just enough suffering for enlightenment, even for the most fortunate of you people. So dukkha then is is a noble truth. Uh, now that's taking something quite banal, ordinary, common, because that relates to the highest level, the Queen Elizabeth, to the, the most miserable wretch, uh, you know, the, in, in, in Britain. The suffering, you know, everybody suffers. You don't get out of it by becoming Queen Elizabeth. So, so then, this suffering, then understanding there is this suffering is. So it's like suffering usually is what we're trying to get away from, and then it's what we don't want. Pain, physical pain. 
uh, worries and anxieties and 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 rumors. There's so many horrible rumors going around now about wars and disease and plagues and overpopulation and refugees and and poverty and and uh, terrorists and who knows what. You know, they would be more frightening than than uh, you know the way the media likes to play up all this. You know, so we're 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 in a society where fear is is generally, you know, what we're getting. We're we're being programmed to be frightened. <coughs> and so, uh, then this this the suffering then is what we we begin to see see your suffering as noble truth rather than uh, some miserable thing that you'd like to get rid of. So where we want security, safety, beauty, happiness, good health, long life, beautiful complexion. We you know, that's what we'd like, but but we can't even if we have all that, it's still we still suffer. So the suffering then is we turn to it. We observe suffering is is yeah, this suffering is this. This is feeling of dis ease of feeling just insecure or not knowing what to do or, or being confused. Just feeling confused. You can recognize, isn't it? What that which is aware of confusion or insecurity. So it's turning away turning not just trying to get rid of it by seeking happiness, but actually understanding it. So you have to look at it and receive it and acknowledge it. It's like this, and and so that is is uh, the uh, first noble truth. Using suffering, and then by pursuing that, we become we increasingly have confidence in the way of non-suffering. So it's taking what's obvious, what's ordinary. That you know that that every human being experiences, and turning to it, and so we're not just caught reacting and and trying to run away, find happiness, but accepting it, acknowledging it, receiving it, and investigating. So the three other noble truths are all about investigating, re- recognizing non-suffering. And that, that is through recognizing, realizing awareness. So awareness is the, like bring, bringing the awareness to suffering. Is like shining a light, on, you know, on this this uh, thing that we tend to just react to, and and try to resist. Mm-hmm. So also recognize the importance of being patient patient because we're not we we tend to be very impatient wanting to get rid of pain and anything unpleasant as quickly as possible but you know see that restlessness is is you know is is a, is another form of suffering just trying to get rid of things just trying to resist is suffering itself so just observing this and so this sense of sitting here, observing, witnessing, allowing. And so when your w- thoughts come and and just let them come, you know, don't try to resist thinking or control it, but just be the knower, the observer, like this, rather than someone who's trying to to stop to to resist or make your mind stop thinking if you let if you trust this then then the, these things resolve themselves in a way that you know that isn't through controlling everything because as soon as you're into control then you you're also going to lose control so it's not a matter of control but of being patient 
and uh, and trusting in your own ability, in awakeness, awareness. This you can really trust, as I said before, it's refuge. It's the the only refuge. It's the deathless. So it's here and now. So it's not something far away in the distant future that you might get if you're lucky. It's just waking up and recognizing it's real and it, it's not it's not refined. It's not an extreme. It's quite ordinary. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening.